Good afternoon and welcome to the 2013 Kristen Anderson Moore Lecture. I'm Carol Emig, President of Child Trends. I want to welcome the audience here today and also the audience watching us on the internet. This year's lecture examines timely and important questions about the use of digital media by infants and toddlers. And we have a great lineup of experts here ready to take on this tough issue. But before we get started, I want to thank the Irving B. Harris Foundation for their support of Child Trends early childhood work and for this webcast in particular. And I want to say a word about the Kristen Anderson Moore Lecture. This annual event was established by our Board of Directors to honor Chris Moore's leadership as President of Child Trends from 1992 to 2006. Equally important, it honors her outstanding leadership in the broader child and youth field. We're fortunate that Chris continues to do her groundbreaking research here at Child Trends as a senior scholar and as co-director of our youth development area. Today, Child Trends is the largest independent research center in the U.S. focused exclusively on improving the lives and prospects of children and youth. With more than 100 staff researching a wide range of issues, we're building the field of effective programs and policies. Chris has been and continues to be in the forefront of that work, and we're happy every year that we have this occasion to celebrate her many accomplishments. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to present Kristen Anderson Moore. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. And welcome, everyone. I'm pleased all of us could join us for this important discussion. I've spent my career researching a range of children's issues, but I'm also a parent, and I'm now a proud grandparent. All of us want our children and our grandchildren to get off to a healthy start in life. We now know so much about the critical first years of life and how important they are to brain development. We also know that a warm, nurturing home environment is important for our infants and toddlers. And we know that learning takes place rapidly, well before our kids enter preschool or kindergarten. It's no secret that we as parents, grandparents, educators, and child care providers, we are exposed to a proliferation of technology and digital devices. Mobile phones are nearly universal. Tablets such as iPads are found in many homes and classrooms now. And there has been an explosion of applications developed for parents with young children. We also know that our youngest children are spending a fair amount of time in front of a TV. In fact, Child Trends has reported that nearly half of kids, two and under, spend an hour daily watching television. If you're at a family restaurant or a supermarket or even at the park, you can see how often young kids are playing on their parents' mobile devices these days. But what do we know about what and when technology and digital media should be made available to our toddlers and preschoolers? What does the research say? From the lens of child development, what is the right role for technology? These are just some of the questions we'll discuss today with our panel. Let me introduce you to our experts who have volunteered to share their knowledge and thoughts on this issue. First, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kathy hirsch Pasek on the end. Kathy's a professor of psychology at Temple University and the director of Infant and Child Lab at Temple. She's also the author of the book, Einstein Never Used Flashcards, How Children Really Learn <laughs> and Why They Need to Play More and Memorize Less. Next, I'm pleased to welcome Lisa Guernsey. Lisa is the director of the Early Childhood Initiative at the New American Foundation. She is also the, the author of a book, Screen Time, How Electronic Media from Baby Videos to Educational Software Affect Your Young Child. And a final welcome to Dr. Rosemarie Trujillo. Rosemarie is the Senior Vice President of Curriculum and Content for Education, Research, and Outreach at Sesame Workshop. She's responsible for the development of content for Sesame Street and oversees educational content for the electric company currently airing on PBS Kids Go. She's a well-regarded expert on the effects of television on the cognitive and social development of children and adolescents. For those of you watching online, you can join the discussion with a comment or a question on Twitter using the hashtag TOTSandTech. That's pound sign, TOTS, the letter N, 
We plan to take some questions from both our audience here and our internet viewers. I'd like to ask Kathy to get us started by giving a developmental psychologist's perspective on what we know about early development. Well, Chris, I want to start by first saying that it's so exciting to be here with everyone and to be here at a lecture that honors you, honors all of us. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. And um, I'm just going to spend a minute to uh, bring you into the land of developmental psychology, as Chris <laughs> just called it, <laughs> and to tell you what's happening there. Um, and the first thing I do want you to know is that the, um, the apps and the digital platforms are changing so quickly that really psychology and researchers hardly have a chance to keep up. It's like the moment we start to grab at something, it's something new. Um, and that's something to keep in mind as we go to the land of developmental um, psychology, is that there's not tons that we know per se about how children interact with apps or how they interact with the kind of digital media platforms. Um, sometimes I even forget that we've only had iPads for three years and that in those three years, over a third of our population has some sort of tablet in their home. So that's pretty remarkable. All right, so what do we know that we can extrapolate from what we've learned about children using television and from our research in the science of learning that we might be able to use as a guide for what we can say about the amount of time that children maybe should be spending in front of digital media and also what can we say about the quality of that experience. And um, since I only have five minutes and I'm a professor, it's really hard to do this, but I'm going to try. I promise I'm going to try. All right. So from the science of learning, the first thing you need to know is that we don't know a lot about any relationships between brain development and digital platforms. We're not there yet. Um, really just about a year ago, a little over a year ago, we started to develop some very exciting measures that are going to allow us to peer into the infant brain. But do remember that when we use these measures, we have to keep the baby really still. Yes. Think about that, okay? <laughs> so it'll be a while until we can actually give you these links between brain parts or brain functions and, and what's going on in specific content areas. But we are making headway. Um, so what do we know about the science of learning and from the behavioral data? And there we know mountains of evidence that I think can be useful. Let's look at quantity for just a moment. You already know the American Academy of Pediatrics has made a recommendation that there should be no screen media or digital media for kids under age two. Now if we look at the science, they're absolutely right because the kids are not getting much out of it before age two. However, Many of the people watching are probably parents like I am. And having three sons, I know that sometimes you need to take a shower. So I get it. So the question becomes not what is optimal, but what can you get away with, <laughs> which, is a, which is a very different kind of question. And there I think the answer to the quantity question becomes one of compromise. And that is what are you, what are you giving up on and what do we know? Well, there we know that being physical matters and it matters to young children a lot. And in fact, when we look at the data, even for very young children, preschool and younger, we see that the amount of activity that they have, it projects all the way out in trajectories to their later activity levels and their later health. So we may not want couch potatoes starting at a very young age. Secondly, we know that one of the things that humans do best is be social. We are, as my colleague Mike Tomasello says, the ultra-social species more than any other species. And we learn by being in interaction with other people. So if we have a lot of activities on digital platforms that are solo activities, and it's taking us away from the conversations and the interactions, then we're not doing justice to how humans learn. When we talk about the timing per se, we know that a lot of preschoolers today are spending the equivalent of a part-time job watching screen media. So we have to think about what's the right amount and what that balance ought to be. Let me move to the quality of the experience. There, I would argue that if we know that screen media and digital platforms are everywhere, and they are everywhere, then the question is, how can we build them in the best possible way 
so that the activities our children are engaged in are really, oh my gosh, the best. So I understand I have to wrap, so I'm going to give you a tweet. What we ought to do <coughs> is we ought to build these activities so that they have active, not passive involvement by children. We ought to build them so that the children are engaged, not distracted by what's going on in the screen media. If you're going to have a story, don't break it up with games that take you away from the story. Number three, we should make it meaningful because when we disembody the information, it's not going to be educational at all. And number four, it should be interactive and social because that's where we learn best. Active, engaged, meaningful, and interactive. That's the tweet for today if we want to put the education back in educational media. Thank you very much, Kathy. And turning to Lisa, what led you down the path of exploring this issue? Well, first I want to say thanks again for um, mm -hmm. inviting mm -hmm. me. Um, this is a, a topic that is absolutely kind of dear to my heart, and, um, and I'll explain why. I, I started um, my career as an education and technology reporter and thought I, you know, kind of knew what was going on out there when it came to how technology affected kids. And then I actually had children. <laughs> and uh, boy, that, you know, start asking a whole <laughs> different set of questions right. at that point. So I had a one and a three-year-old, and um, this was pre-iPad, but very much in the baby Einstein video days. And I just had just a ton of questions about what was really going on in my kids' brains as they were, you know, seeing what was on the screen. Um, and I also was getting a little alarmed because there were headlines out there that were making me think, gosh, I'm rewiring my kids' brains by putting them in front of a screen, and how dare I even kind of think about having the TV on around kids so young. So I decided to spend some time really digging into this and wanted to understand better what the research actually says on this issue. Um, and it was, it was such an eye-opening experience. It actually led me to get to know the folks for, for the, the right and the left of me here because the res there are really good researchers digging into this question. And um, often what they're finding is not what we're hearing in the headlines. So let me just kind of cut straight to the, to the chase. After a couple of years of looking at the research on develop, you know, how children's minds develop and how they, their social interactions help them to become learners and um, where media fits in that, I, I came down to um, a mantra for myself that I think has become kind of helpful for other parents as well and other educators. And that is that instead of just thinking about the amount of time children might be spending with a device or with a, a, a box that has images on it, um, we should be looking at the three C's. And the three C's are these. Let's look at the content. What are they seeing on the screen? Or in the case of an iPad or a more interactive experience, what are they playing with? That's content. What about the context? Who's around the child when they're experiencing this? Um, and uh, how is it fitting into their daily routine? Uh, what we know from so much of the other research on what's good for kids can apply to the way we use media with young children, but we have to understand that that means making sure they do have those moments for social interaction. Um, and it means uh, making sure that they still have time for you know, good sleep patterns and uh, the ability to play um, outside um, and with their, with their peers. So that's the second C, context. And the third C is your child, uh, especially having two children. It becomes very obvious, and I'm sure many of you in the room or watching recognize this well, it becomes very obvious how different kids can be, even when they're growing up with the same parents <laughs> in the same house, with the same books being read to them, et cetera, like night and day differences. And so you have to really tune into what some children are more prone to do with media or the way they're using it or experiencing it or becoming upset by it or becoming, you know, completely, you know, fixated on it. And, and other kids are going to be completely different. Um, and this is where we do not have a good uh, range of research. I think that we haven't individualized very much yet in terms of what different dis dispositions um, of children, you know, mean for their interactions with media. But those three C's can at least help us open up a new level of conversation about how uh, screen media especially, and I think also interactive media, works for young kids. Thank you, Lisa. Start. And Rosemary, you're a developmental psychologist. How did your training uh, lead you to working at Sesame Workshop? Well, I had the, uh, well, first of all, I want to say thank you as, as well. And um, 
being in the seat of, of representing the industry, I, I really appreciate having that point of view represented on, on this panel, so, so, so thank you. Um, I had the great pleasure to uh, study with two wonderful mentors, um, John Wright and Aletha Houston, uh, both uh, very uh, well-known and renowned cognitive psychologists, developmental psychologists, and they developed, they, well, they devoted their whole career in studying the effects of media on child development, both the positive and the negative effects. So um, it's a great pleasure for me to work at uh, Sesame Workshop, which is a nonprofit um, educational company that harnesses the power of media uh, to provide educational experiences so that children, as well as the, the, the adults in their lives, um, could help them reach their highest potential. So here's an example of um, a company trying to do good with these various tools. And I think this is really important for us to, to understand, and I, and I really appreciate um, the work that Kathy does and, and uh, how Lisa summarized a lot of this research in these three C's, because I think that these are wonderful uh, takeaway messages that we really got to give a lot of thought to how children learn and the kind of learner that uh, the child is, we got to give a lot of thought to content. And I think that, uh, unfortunately, parents are not stopping and thinking about these content experiences. What's out there uh, most often is the amount of time. And I'm not, I'm not discrediting that. Time is very valuable. And as Kathy said, if you're spending time uh, with a screen, what, are, what is that displacing? Uh, but we're not giving enough attention, and, and researchers are not giving enough attention to the different kinds of content experiences. Um, and the context, you know, where are the adults in this media e experience? Mm -hmm. And Sesame Workshop uh, cares about these three C's. Uh, the work that we do is grounded in developmental psychologists. Uh, we have a staff devoted, a very large staff devoted uh, in-house to the development of content across all media platforms. Other media um, uh, companies tend to outsource. They freelance uh, these, these uh, experts. So um, we're, from the very beginning, which we started 45 years ago, the purpose of designing these media experiences are for educational um, uh, purposes. The other thing that we take um, a lot of great pride is that we create content that does not keep the parents out of the media experience. We create it on two different levels because we want the parent to be co-engaged in our content because we know that children do learn best through parent-child interactions and we want them to be enjoying it. And a lot of other children's programs create content just for the child and the parents run from the room. And I think we all know uh, wh what programs uh, they are. So, uh, <laughs> without saying what they are. Um, so I think that we, we have to um, think about these various content experiences and not blame parents or shame parents. And I think that's what's happening nowadays uh, in the popular press, is we're making parents feel badly about how they're using these devices, and we need to empower them to use them as tools in educating their young children. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, we already have some questions from the audience, and um, I have my own questions. Um, a combination is, what are the risks or the harms? Uh, what is the harmful potential of too much digital exposure? But the parallel side or, is what are the gains? What are the benefits of exposure to educational media? I'll jump in with um, one, of the, one of the things that I found um, on the harm side that was not on my radar screen originally was the difference between background <coughs> television and foreground television. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what the background television means for children's development. So just take a, a minute to explain that um, because I do think it's not out there really in the, in the lexicon yet. Um, foreground television, and I think this also can apply to, to digital media and more interactive formats, but we need to figure, out, figure that part out. But foreground um, television is what's um, intended to be understood by young children and is something for them to watch and, and hopefully to learn from if it's been designed with a, an actual uh, learning goal in mind. Background television is 
what's just on when you're <coughs> walking into the living room and maybe it's Jeopardy or maybe it's the nightly news or maybe it's, you know, CSI or, you know, uh, Homeland um, and is not intended to be understood by a kid under the age of, of six. Maybe in some cases um, we might think that our, you know, seven or eight year olds are getting it. Still even there we have some research showing they probably aren't really understanding it the way we, we think we are. So when it's not made for them but it's always on, um, we're seeing in some really some good experimental research um, as well as some longitudinal studies of how children have progressed um, through the early years that it can have some harmful effects. It changes um, the way that children play. It's changing their play patterns so that instead of having the time to focus <laughs> on um, say a little school bus and opening the little door of the school bus and letting the little um, figurines go in the school bus and kind of helping the child have an internal dialogue about what they're playing with, um, we see that kids might you know bang around on the school bus and then they move to another toy and then they move to another toy and then they move to another toy even though they're not actually looking at the tv screen something about that tv being on has changed the way they're playing um, in ways that is worrying to child development experts and then the other more obvious um, reason for being concerned a little bit about the background um, television whether it's background noise or the images is the way it affects the parents and their interactions with young children um, and, and this is not to say, and I gotta say, even for me, I, I try to change my behavior a little bit as a parent, but you can't fix everything. And there's just times when, of course, really? you're gonna have the food network. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know, forget it. We can't go for perfection here. Let's just go for what, you know, what can be the best um, um, learning environment for your kids in, re in real life. And so sometimes um, it means making sure that you're just aware, wait, do I need that TV on? Maybe I should actually have a real conversation with my child for a moment. Um, and other times it just means, hmm, well, right now it's on, but um, I just need to make sure that when I leave the room, I am going to turn it off. I'm not going to leave my child around with it on. So we just need to be thinking about that. That's one of, one of those sort of more harmful effect um, technology areas I think we need to talk about. Well, I'll, I'll jump in actually with um, just a pinch of the potential harm, but then I really want to go to what I think are amazing opportunities. Um, I'll say for you, Rosemary, and then you can jump okay, in with, great, the, with the specifics. <laughs> um, but but I, I do think we have to be more conscious as users of media and as parents who have kids who are using constant media. This stuff is like dessert, you know? It's really attractive, and there's a lot of things you can do with a really fun app, moving things around on a board. In fact, you've all probably seen that YouTube where the kid thinks that the magazine should come alive, right? By going like this on a magazine, it's just fabulous. So um, I think there are as yet unharnessed opportunities that we haven't caught. And we're largely leaving our kids to discover them and we have to be more conscious about it. And we do have to be conscious about, as you said, having that conversation with our children and not outsourcing it to the machines. Um, now to the opportunities. Uh, you know, I believe that I've even been introduced to new perspectives and to new worlds by watching things that come from Sesame Street. When it's done well, I think it offers a wealth of possibilities, especially for underprivileged kids. Um, a lot of our nation is living, unfortunately, in poverty. It's something like 26 percent, I mean, correct me if I got it wrong, but it's around 26 percent of children are living in poverty mm -hmm. right now. Yeah, under the age of five it is. It's under the age of five. And, and you know, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. And what we're recognizing as we think about the language problem, many of us have heard about the 30 million word gap. Well, the 30 million word gap has a lot of things packed in there. One is that perchance parents aren't speaking as much with their children. Notice I didn't say to or at, but with their children. But the other thing is that there's a lot of experiences, world experiences that the children don't have, and so they can't have vocabulary for those world experiences. And great programs that are, as I said, active, engaged, and meaningful, and interactive, they bring you a world you could never see otherwise. I, and I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I'm, a, I'm in a, the position <coughs> where um, I am looking at what are the educational and societal needs and health needs of, of really young children. And our content is curriculum driven. So our content, our curriculum gets revised on an annual basis. And when we found out about the word gap, yeah. what did we do? We created a segment called Word on the Street where we're introducing children to pretty sophisticated words, but with that 
word, you're also learning about concepts. So we created a STEM curriculum, science, technology, engineering, and math. And we're introducing children to engineering terms and science terms. And we test to see what they are comprehending. So not only do we do the formative research, which has a lot to do when you're dealing with um, interactive um, uh, design, to see what they can possibly physically do uh, with their with their finger or not mm -hmm. with their with their finger, um, and to design it in a way so it is an educational uh, experience. Uh, and as I talked about the word uh, on the street segment is. We, are we created this great content, but what do children comprehend? Mm -hmm. And we learned that there are significant gains in their vocabulary. Not only is there their ability to point to the word, but actually describe what that word mm -hmm. or means. Mm -hmm. So, and with the STEM content, we're trying to tell parents that don't be afraid of science, don't be afraid of, of math, and you should be co-investigating uh, with your children. So um, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Kathy. If you use these tools properly, it is opening up uh, a world of possibilities. So Possibly. what age is that STEM curricula de devoted to? Our content is um, designed for children between the ages of two and five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was just going to mm -hmm. chime in, if I might, for, with one example, because I think it speaks so much to, to STEM and the kinds of things that you guys do so well which science, is technology. science, technology, edu yeah, engineering, <laughs> and mathematics. And we're, we're talking a lot about that. And STEAM sometimes, yes. where you add the A in for the arts, which I think is really cool. But, but the one example, uh, which, which I think will really speak or spoke to me as a, a parent, was the triangle. OK, so you can think of the triangle as baby geometry, all right? And it turns out that some of these spatial concepts are really important. And young kids can comprehend them. And it's another mm -hmm. place, by the way, where there's an achievement gap, a huge achievement gap by age three. All right, now, what do young children think a triangle is? They think a triangle is a thing with a point at the top. But you all know that if I tilt the triangle, it's still a triangle. And by gosh, the triangle doesn't even need to be like perfectly even on each mm -hmm. side. You know, it's just, it can be a narrow triangle, it can be a fat triangle, and it's still a triangle. So if you never show anything, but a triangle with the point at the top, children are never going to walk away with anything, but triangles are things with points at the top. What Sesame does so well in the other very good educational programs, I mean, Sesame's not the only one out there, um, is that they give kids the breadth of experiences to allow them to derive the richer concepts that they're going to need as foundational for learning. Well, I wanted to ask you about something that's been in the news a lot lately. It is uh, this new toy for, or it's not a toy, a seating for an infant. Uh, it holds an iPad directly in front of uh, an infant in a reclining seat. What's your reaction? <laughs> Lucy? <Lunacy? Horror. laughs> Thank you. That's it. It's perfect. Horror. It's each year you'd think it can't get worse, and it did. <laughs> uh, can, I, can I give you a great line? Yeah. I got this from someone from the Boston Globe one day. They were calling me about the, uh, the Baby Einstein stuff, and they said, but don't you understand the trees on Baby Einstein are so amazing. Shouldn't the kids be looking at the trees and Baby Einstein in the car? And I said, well, there are trees outside Something the window <laughs> of the car. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The message that that sends is what, what's a little bit worrying, and I do think that that's why, I mean, not a little bit worrying, a lot worrying. A lot worrying, mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why when I kind of came to this research in the beginning, there were those um, alarming headlines out there because right now we're in this, I think parents and educators are caught between um, the industry kind of speaking for what technology should mean for children on one hand, and, and sometimes that industry is going way too far and just not, uh, not recognizing what messages they're sending about what might be appropriate for a young child. And that is a case in point of something completely just sending all the wrong messages about where children, what children need. On the other hand, you have, um, and often this is from the health and, and, and medical community, but from other places as well, some just some incredibly kind of fear-based messaging around kind of the toxicity of even touching technology, honestly. Like, I mean, Maybe that's a little extreme, but sometimes you kind of get that <laughs> feeling like, oh, I'd really better just completely keep my child away from this at all. And, and what we actually need is, it's not even a meeting in the middle, honestly. It's a whole different plane in the way we're thinking about this, mm -hmm. where we're recognizing what, um, 
when designed well and used appropriately and when the messages to parents make, make sense in terms of social interaction, where we can think about the way that technology or the content coming through it can help us in, engage more, spark new ideas, conversations with our um, young children, open them up to new worlds, lead them to, to, to conversations later, even when it's turned off, and when you're done with the where's your water game on the app, you know, then later you see something while you're in the restroom and the water's coming out of the faucet and you're talking about it in relation to what you experienced earlier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot more that we can be doing and talking about when it comes to technology and kids, but instead we have you know, those sorts of images out there and those sorts of products that parents are being kind of told to buy for their kids. And, and that means that our conversation just becomes really pitiful. Well, with, <laughs> with promises. I mean, that's the other problem is that as these companies sort of usurp the developmental psychology in the public arena, there are promises that are just untrue. I mean, there are many companies promising that you can, you know, have your child become bilingual by buying the right kind of mobile. Not, right? <laughs> right? We know it's about having language interactions with real human beings. Or I love the ones that tell us that we're going to have mathematics for infants. Let's go double knot, okay? And there's a lot of research here. And we know that infants are attuned to number, but being attuned to number in certain ways and the way they process number is not saying that infants, and notice I'm talking babies here, can do mathematical <coughs> calculations. Is there an age where you think um, digital media should be zero or almost zero? Is there a cutoff age? I'm going to say no. I'm going to uh, take the extreme here because I think what parents have to be more mindful is what are they doing with these tools? So um, I don't think I put a screen in front of a you know freshly um, born <laughs> baby, you know, <laughs> two hours old. But if a parent is using a screen with a six-month-old and they're looking at family photos, um, and or they're they're looking at an e a very simple ebook, but the parent is actually engaged in descriptive language, I don't see a problem with that because once again it's used as a tool it's used as a piece of of stimulus um, but that apparatus uh, is is not a movie. Um, so Gee, we all love uh, it where the, uh, <laughs> you know where the child is it can't move I mean they can't even mm -hmm. uh, disengage other than to, to go to sleep uh -huh. uh, which I hope they do to get those images out of their minds but, um, <laughs> I, I'm often asked, um, you know, what do we know about kids under two and if they yeah, and even can learn from technology or not? And so my first reaction always is like, well, what's on this, what technology? Like, let's break this down, you know, it's, it's not just um, a monolithic thing. Um, but uh, the research on different kinds of uh, video-based information is actually more mixed than we might be led to believe. Um, even around that age of 24 months or so. Um, there are a couple of studies that have shown in controlled experiments that are not exactly like what you see at, in homes, but in controlled experiments that there is some evidence that 21-month-olds, um, that 22-month-olds 22 22 might be able to pick up a little bit of information um, from what's on the screen when it is provided to them in a way that's similar to the way a parent would label and point to something and really kind of help them learn the, the name of, a, of an object or a word. We also, though, have research just around that same age, around 24 months, that um, kids uh, may not really be picking up what we think they are. And sometimes parents can hear children bringing out a lot more vocabulary at that age, because that's such a word spurt moment yeah. for young yeah. children. Mm -hmm. And so they associate it with, oh my gosh, they just watched you know, two hours of <laughs> XYZ program, and look, now they know all these new words, and they may not realize that sometimes it's their interaction with their children mm -hmm. around that mm -hmm. content and that media that's helped those children learn those words. So we still have a lot to unpack around the age of two. I think what Rosemary said earlier about the, that it's that engagement that the parent can make with mm -hmm. the media around the mm -hmm. children that can lead us to maybe a different conversation about really, really young children in media. How are, how are parents using it to spark new songs they can sing together, new nursery rhymes they can tell? You know, is it giving parents kind of new tools to remember and, or for the first time experience how to interact with kids? Yes, I think little, little kids. there's complete consensus here, don't you think? I mean, mm -hmm. we're all suggesting that at young ages it's um, parent using these tools as a platform 
or as a tool, not as an end in itself. And as an end in itself, I, I actually would agree with the American Academy of Pediatrics. But if it's something that's going to help parents learn these new songs or see new animals or bring out new conversations, then I think it's terrific. I do just want to spend one second to take the blame off of parents, though, for just a moment. Because in a sense, as we say, parents need to be more conscious, and we, we're saying they need to be sort mm -hmm. of mindful mm -hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to do that as a mom. No, I really mean that. I'm seeing 20,000 apps in the marketplace that are, that are labeled so-called, I can't do it without the so-called, I'm sorry, so-called educational apps. Now, if these things are coming out on the market and are so-called educational apps, am I supposed to not believe them? Mm -hmm. I mean, what am I supposed to do as a parent to really know whether it's educational or not? So I'll just throw that back to my colleagues. No, no, I, I, mm -hmm. And I'm the one who <laughs> said right. mindfulness. Right. And so I guess I think what we have to do is that we have to help educate yeah. parents. And that's what we at Sesame Workshop are trying to do. We're trying to give information to the parents. So when we're creating an app, uh, we're, we're putting a lot of parent information mm -hmm. into the app uh, and hope that parents will read it. What we're trying to say is that we design these apps uh, so that if you don't want the bells and whistles, you can turn them off. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the design process. And we spend a lot of time talking to parents mm -hmm. as well as interacting with children so that we're creating mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. an experience that would be um, a, a much more beneficial co-engagement educational experience. And you're right, a lot of parents don't know how to make those, those judgments. We've talked a lot about parents. What about um, early childhood education or daycare centers? Is there a role for electronic digital technology there? What are the caveats? So um, I, I think so with, with, with several caveats. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure that those, you know, those of you who are, are watching or in the room know about the national um, Association for the Education of Young Children's uh, ish, um, position statement on this. They did it actually in conjunction with the Fred Rogers Center and uh, just came out last year. Um, and it's one that's it's just got, it's got a lot of nuance in it and it's bringing out the point that um, when used intentionally to direct children's learning, or not direct certainly, but to help kind of guide um, children's learning, then it it, it may very much have a role, and um, again, I don't think we can be monolithic about it. We have to talk about different kinds of technologies and media and content and contexts. But, um, but they also put a real stress on the professional development that's needed, the, head of the, the training, helping teachers see what it means to use different kinds of materials in, um, in developmentally appropriate ways, and, and there's just not a lot of that kind of professional development going on out there. Um, when it comes to the use of different kinds of technology and tools. So I think that that's where the field has to move to really be much more um, mindful and helpful to, to teachers in figuring this stuff out. We are in the process of doing two pilot studies, one with teaching strategies and one with success for all. And the whole idea here is not only to provide child-facing content and to look at their curriculum and to see how we can supplement their curriculum with uh, digital media, but uh, to use the uh, experience for teacher development, but also have better school home links. And I have to say it's been very promising. And mm -hmm. I think that, mm -hmm. keep in mind, media can provide a perspective that children sometimes can't get in, in real life. Uh, we talk about those process films. You know, while it's great to go on these field trips, we know that children not going on these field trips. So how do we use media strategically in that way? Another one I was sharing as we were having lunch is that we just created a game um, which is part of our aggregated digital hub on STEM content. I urge you all to, to go <laughs> to it because uh, it's just filled with information not only for teachers but for parents as well. But we created a game for sink and float and everyone what you do with sink and float, you're at the surface of the water and you drop something in. You make a prediction, is it gonna, is it gonna stay on the surface or is it gonna go to, to the bottom of the bucket? Well, because of technology, we were able to now have Grover swim as a scuba diver inside the ocean, stop in the middle of the screen. Now children are gonna make a prediction while he's in the water. Is the object gonna float to the surface or will it sink to the floor of the ocean? That's a perspective they're not gonna get in real life. 
but media can provide it. And it's another perspective on sink and float. So I just, that, that, that's an example of using media uh, for, for good and to provide a perspective mm -hmm. that you can't get in real life. So can I take it? Can I take it out of curriculum for just a sure. sec? Because um, Lisa just had this amazing conference, mm -hmm. and do you remember the people from Carnegie Mellon? I think mm -hmm. were doing an experiment in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. where it wasn't just about giving everyone a tablet or thinking about new curriculum, but they had a digital camera, as I recall. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And the kids could take a picture of what was going on in their classroom. Mm -hmm. They could nest the camera into this, uh, what was it, like a kiosk? Yeah, Basically. Message From Me is right. the name message of the project. Okay, so do you want to say a little more about it? Well, it was neat because it was that basically children who are designing their messages that they could then send that day to mom and dad. Like, hey, we just got back from a field trip and Jesse's here with me and we picked up pine cones and can Jesse come over for dinner? Right. You and know, and, this, and then suddenly <laughs> that's sent out to mom and dad. Right, so we should think way beyond what's yeah. here now into Absolutely. what the future can be. Yeah. That's a good example. So a couple questions um, from the audience. About uh, the differential effects of media on young children living in poverty compared with their more affluent peers. And what's the recommendation for digital exposure with disadvantaged children in preschool settings? So it's varied. Can I jump in with some findings from a recent report that I think are, are, are worth in a f bearing in mind here? Um, Ready to Learn, which is the U.S. Department of Education um, program that. Um, enables uh, producers and researchers to, to really look at what different types of media mean to kids in their learning. Um, it it uh, came out with a report, well the, the researchers actually were two research firms, EDC and SRI, came out with a report on some math uh, media that was being tested. And um, what they found, and they were doing this with uh, low income um, children in, from low income families in Head Start centers and in child care centers where where these kids really did not have a lot of other kind of resources. Um, and they looked at three different conditions. Um, business as usual, just, you know, we're going to tell you, going to go ahead and see what you can do with teaching math to kids. Another condition was, um, hey, you can use a smart board or some tablets and see what you can do to use, you know, teach the math to, to young children. And then the third was using a very purposefully designed um, suite of different kinds of digital media materials um, in conjunction also with some offline ones and some professional development around it um, to help teach early math skills to young kids. And what they found is that it was in that, that final condition, the, um, the ability to kind of combine the technology, the professional development, and the very well designed curriculum where you saw, saw some real gains for these children. They were really starting to kind of make some, some leaps in their math understanding. What's interesting too is that it wasn't just, you know, it's not just about putting technology into the classroom because that wasn't what made the real difference for kids. And that business as usual didn't, wasn't helping them either. So I just think that's a, that's a case where in a, an environment that was very much, um, you know, these were, low, these were kids that are kind of unfortunately part of that achievement gap conversation we need to have and they were finding a way to help them really um, bring, their, bring their math skills up at young, young ages. So there's some research that's not published yet, but um, I should tell you about it because it's so exciting. And it comes out of the One Laptop Per Child program that is um, being used in many of the countries down in Latin America. In Uruguay, I think every family has the One mm -hmm. Laptop Per Child. Mm -hmm. And in Argentina, they have a whole swath of families, especially in the very low, low income areas. And um, right outside of Buenos Aires, <laughs> a, a colleague of mine, Mariano Sigmund, and his lab has been looking at putting on these very exciting games that were informed by um, developmental psychologists and cognitive psychologists that are designed with research in mind to help kids with attention, problem solving skills, uh, creativity, language, STEM skills, again, science, technology, engineering, and math. And what did they find by putting these games on the laptop and by tracking how long the children are actually using the games, they can then investigate school readiness. Mm -hmm. And they found that it actually increases aspects of school readiness as the kids play some of these well-designed games. So again, I think there's a lot we don't know. Mm -hmm. You're starting to mm -hmm. see these projects coming out, but the potential is absolutely enormous. Yeah, and we've done a lot with community engagement pro uh, uh, 
projects uh, where we're creating um, educational resources using digital delivery systems to get information out to uh, communities and covering a, a wide range of content areas, uh, health, literacy, math, yeah. and most recently focusing on resiliency. So I don't know how many people have seen <laughs> our work on uh, divorce and incarceration, uh, but to really provide information to, to parents. Listen, I don't think there's going to be, as the cost of these digital uh, gadgets are getting uh, lower and lower and lower, there's not going to be um, a gadget gap. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. going to be a content gap and how you, mm. kinds of content experiences you're going to be using on these, these gadgets. So I think the more we can do to make uh, parents aware of the wonderful content that's out there, I, I think that if it's designed well, yeah. with a very specific purpose, and it's used intentionally, I think we're going to see learning gains. I would add to that, though, I think that's a really interesting distinction, gadget gap versus content gap. Yeah. I've been looking at, is there a mentorship gap? Interesting. Is oh, there is there something like we that. need to understand about the, the people around children, the adult mm -hmm. caregivers, the, their parents, the, the teachers? and what they know and how they can use mm -hmm. different kinds of media like with that. kids. And I think That's that nice. for some, nice. some who are at very high and more affluent levels, they got all sorts of people around and we're helping them figure this stuff out. Right. And a I lot like of kids that. who use they, they're in less privileged circumstances don't have That's that. That's right, I like that membership. That's good. Mentorship yeah. Yeah. Nice. You know, There's a related question came in from the online audience about educational toys and uh, whether they help English language development for children in non-English speaking households. Hmm. Well, um, I guess as a language person, I'll speak you to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, we haven't done any direct tests on this, and I think one of the reasons that many of us wouldn't do a direct test on that is that we know how language is learned. And it's not learned from a television, and it's not learned from a toy. One of the most important pieces of language development is that back and forth, that conversation. And without the conversation, you're just not going to learn language. Now, we actually know this because there is research uh, many years ago from um, deaf families that thought the really best way that they could help their hearing child learn spoken language was to turn the television on. And it turned out not mm -hmm. to work mm -hmm. at all. Um, we also know by many, many studies that have looked particularly um, under age two and a half, I'll say, and language learning from the under two and a half crowd. And they don't learn a lot of vocabulary uh, or language skills from televised experiences. They're not getting it from television. Now we did a study that just came out, in fact, where we compared television and we compared um, video chat to the television and to live. And I should let everybody out there guess how it came out, but I'll tell you since we're limited in time. <laughs> uh, but it turns out that the video chat looked a lot like live. So again, That's when so you have the conversation, the children learn languages. And they're not going to learn as much when it's not in the conversation. These toys, electronic toys or non-electronic toys, it's not a conversation. Well, another uh, online um, viewer asks, are young children missing out on anything when they are not exposed to digital media? Kind of follows mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I, I actually get that question a lot when I talk to preschool parents um, yeah. about some of the themes from my book because often, um, often I'm going to preschools where the parents um, do have a lot of resources and for them it's about how do I limit instead of how do I provide access mm -hmm. to because they're a little worried that they're getting too much, you know. Um, and again, I, I try to say, well, let's first talk about three C's because mm -hmm. it's not just about how much time they have. But after we go there, then there's this larger question of um, what, what we learned from kind of book reading with young kids is that exposing them to even just how a book works, you know, how it opens, how we turn the pages, um, how we think about kind of what the cover is telling us and then what different parts. Those are, those are important parts of, kind of understanding the, the technology of a book. And, and we wouldn't want to keep kids away from kind of understanding the technology of a mm -hmm. book. So do we need to now move to a place where there's a, a, a literacy of the, t the h how different yeah. kinds of pieces of technology work yeah. that comes along with helping them understand the content that comes through it? I don't think we have answers actually to this yet, unless you know of some studies. I mean, that, you know, whether there, there's something to um, making sure that kids have ability to touch, feel, use technology that helps them to learn the content from it. I don't know that we actually know that exactly, but based on what we've learned from the book, I think that there's a good chance there is a reason to expose children to some, at least have a chance to use it in 
guidance in concert with, with their parents. Mm -hmm. Now, I just want to add, I mean, I think digital literacies is a very important curriculum, and I don't think we have a full understanding of how uh, to implement such a curriculum. But I think there is a disservice if we keep children away from these experiences because we, they need to know. It's, it's in our world. They're, they're born into this, this, this media-saturated world, and I think that they have to be able to have a better understanding of how it's created mm -hmm. so that they can mm -hmm. then make inferences about the content that's coming out of uh, these experiences. I, I would just like to add a flip side to this, though, because we keep talking about the child as the user of the mm -hmm. digital platform. Mm -hmm. And the other half of that is that kids are exposed to us. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we're constantly on our digital platforms, right. whether it's on my cell phone that just went off or whether it's on an iPad. And I think we also have to look at the consequences of having the people around us constantly not paying attention to us. And there, I think, the children are missing out on a lot. Um, because we often have our eyes glued to something else other than them. And we're sort of giving them the message, I don't want to be in that conversation with you. Um, we just finished, and, and hope it's finished, a study where we're looking at um, cell phone use, because I've, I've actually witnessed parents, when they get a text, dropping the hand of their three and four year old child in the middle of the street to look at the text. And um, I think we have to speak to that part of, of the question as well. Um, we had a, a situation where we taught children words. Uh, and we found that when the word was interrupted by a cell phone call, the child didn't learn. But even more so, and this is preliminary data, but I think interesting preliminary data, when that interruption comes first, early on, the child learns nothing. They don't even learn when the next word is going to be uninterrupted because they're assuming you're not paying attention to me. And I must say, many times at dinner tables when I have friends or my kids who are constantly looking at their cell phones, I feel as if we're not in that interaction. And if human beings are about learning in the social soup, and if brains are wired to pick up on social information, which we know they are, then breaking that and interrupting it with our use of digital media is another problem to think about. Mm -hmm. It's a question about how a parent can identify educational media. You mentioned yeah. how many products there are out there. Yeah. How is a parent <coughs> to know? What should they be looking for? Um, I think they should play with these uh, digital experiences or, or you know, watch these these um, these shows. Uh, one of the we we have on our website. Um, best practices in designing content for touchscreen uh, devices. So you get a sense of, of how we are uh, trying to um, design and structure these experiences. Because you know we, we learn from Kathy's research, um, sometimes we have too many bells and whistles and it's very disruptive. And so I would ask parents mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, when they are reviewing um, digital content to look at that. <laughs> I'm a big person where, I'm a, bi a big proponent of, of when a child gets a wrong answer, I, I really dislike when the VO says um, that, you know, that's not right, or it'll get yeah. a sound effect. Well, why is it not right? Give me some information mm -hmm. that I can start building my knowledge so I can figure out why it's not right and what is right. And so that's where mm -hmm. scaffold learning mm -hmm. uh, comes mm -hmm. in. So our content has a lot of scaffold uh, learning ex experiences. Um, things that are too busy, I get into arguments all the time um, with uh, app reviewers because a lot of our content is not hot. Well, we don't want it to be hot because we don't want to distract the child what do you mean from by hot. By hot, that's a very good question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, by 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 pressing it, you're going right. to get an effect. You know, hot so spot. you so it you hot, if yeah. it's a dog, the dog's going to mm -hmm. go bow wow, or you know, the window will open up, or the door will open up. So there's lots of um, extraneous distractions mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. off the curriculum uh, goal. Mm -hmm. So I want to focus children's attention and, and not get them to be um, distracted by, by this. But we get criticized. I'm going to be very honest. You look at some of the reviews and say, well, you know, you're, we're hitting all these objects 
and you know uh, the window's not going up or the door's not uh, uh, opening up or closing and, and I get frustrated by that. Mm -hmm. Just look at why we're designing it the way we are from an educational point of view. So I have a student who actually gave a name to it when you're pressing all these hot spots. She hot called spots. it induced ADHD. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and she suggested in a study that we did um, that Rosemary was, was um, talking about that when you're reading a book and instead of paying attention to the story, you know that you can keep hitting these hot spots and things will happen, then you lose the storyline. Yep. And the kids had no idea what the storyline was because they spent all their time hitting the buttons. And then you talk about parental engagement. Well, what happened in the parental engagement in our study is that it totally transformed. You know how normally you get a nice little traditional book and you say, Oh, yes, that's a monkey. Now, didn't we see a monkey recently at the zoo and you build on it and you expand on it and then Curious George becomes as much about you as it does about Curious George. Now take it to the hit the buttons moment and what the parents are doing, no, no, let's read the next page. Stop hitting the button. Oh, I wish that button wouldn't be hit anymore. I can't stand the sound. So the moms become more regulators of behavior than they are engaged in the conversation about the book. And I think, you know, when you ask what's the perfect educational toy, well, you know, I'm going to go back to my four little things here. But, but I do think it's great, not always active, right? Sometimes it's active in the discussion and conversation. Doesn't mean you have to be doing jumping jacks. But engaged and focused is really, really important because we distract our kids a lot. We tend to think everyone should be a multitasker and only 2% of people are. That's a low percentage. Um, that Not it should be yeah, meaningful. I mean, I have, I have been a consultant on app designs where they say, we want to put these words in it. And I said, what's the story? <laughs> Give me the story. What's the narrative? Well, we have these words, and we already came up with these pictures. Not good enough. <laughs> and, and, uh, and last, to talk about the social. Can I, I, I was um, thinking, too, that it could be helpful to, to have parents and educators who are watching if I could just name a couple of resources that I've found helpful when it comes to trying to find, and trying to make these distinctions. I think it's really smart to try to play the games or watch before your kids. And, but you don't always have that chance, especially when it's sitting there on his phone, like 99 cents, should I buy it or not? I don't know. Free. Gosh, I just press it because it's free. Um, so let me just tell you about a couple of, of places to go. Um, the Fred Rogers Center has a blog um, where there's often a discussion of a lot of this, and that's very helpful. They also have something called the um, what they call ELLI, which is Early Learning Environment, which is a place where you can go and see a discussion of different kinds of apps and how they could be used in family home care. Um, in, in child care centers, in preschools, in at home, you know, you as a mom or dad with your, your child. That's also a helpful resource. I, I really do think that Sesame Workshop has some really great stuff on their website to help you kind of to guide you on this. So does PBS and the PBS Parent site. Um, I, I think that going to your children's librarian in, in at your public library could be a great resource for trying to find this. We're finding that more and more children's librarians want to get into this mix. They're part of this ebook discussion and trying to figure out how to curate so that they're selecting ebooks or apps that are not full of these kind of, you know, distractions um, in them. Uh, Common Sense Media is another great website out there for um, just seeing what other parents have to say about different apps and also they um, are looking by different ages of children which I think is really helpful when it comes to two and three and four and five years old major differences and lastly two books out there that could be helpful for educators one is Digital Decisions um, another one's titled Teaching in Digital Age from Age 3 to Grade 3 and those are two books that could be useful as well. Thank you. Um, well, we I have reached almost the end of our time, and I want to ask each of the speakers uh, for one quick takeaway, about just a few seconds apiece. Uh, can we start with you, Kathy? Okay, okay so seconds. I'm going to go with your three C's, yeah, along with <laughs> active, engaged, mm -hmm. meaningful, and interactive. Your turn. So I um I think we need to to now that we kind of. Have, uh, recognize we need to think about the three C's and, and, and these different pieces. It's not just about technology as a monolithic thing. I think what's also going to be important to start thinking about mentorship. And media mentorship is kind of an area of research I'll be doing over the next year or so to understand better what do kids and families really need and do we have the structure set up in our society to help them with, with this. Um, all these huge questions they have around media. 
I love that mentorship. Um, I just completed a self-regulation curriculum, so I have this stop and think um, uh, in, in my head. And so I'm going to say, don't be so impulsive. Stop and think mm -hmm. and really give mm -hmm. thought to what kind of experience you are engaged uh, with uh, your, your child or your children and to be much more mindful of the three C's. Thank you very much. And I think it's clear that there aren't yes, no answers, um, that this is a complex topic, but there are some uh, guidelines that was very helpful. Um, it's clear to me that parents and educators need to carefully curate how, when, and what we expose our youngest kids to on TV, mobile apps, and electronic media. I thank you very much for your time and sharing your wisdom with all of us. Big thank you to everyone.